Good morning, everyone. How are you? Or as we say in Hawaii, aloha kakahiaka. It's happy Aloha Friday. It's the end of the week, guys. We made it through another one. Oh, and especially if you made it through last night. Let me just sip and salute you, can I? Yes. So I hope you have a mug of something or a glass of something or a cup of something. Because we're going to sit and chat and we're going to have a fun conversation today because normally I do my show on Saturday. But as you guys know, I am going to be walking in the Komen race, the more than pink race here in Dallas tomorrow. Thank goodness we didn't do it today because we have an absolute uh, dark and very blustery thunderstorm that just moved in this morning. Whew. So it's cooling the temperatures down, which will make tomorrow's race absolutely beautiful. Mm, thank you, Lord. Appreciate that. Well, if you have never caught me live before and you're just now catching me brand new, good morning. Thanks. You probably want to know who this crazy woman is who's just chatting away on Facebook and YouTube saying good morning. But um, my name is Renee Harden, and I am an editor by trade. Um, I am a copywriter, um, and I'm also a former high school English teacher, honors level. Yep. So I love words and I love books and I love all things having to do with stories and things like that. And I love to help people craft their words. So I love to get on here and just inspire you to tell your stories, to realize that your stories are important. Because if I see you posting on Facebook in these long threads, I know you can write. Just want to help you write better and eliminate the typos so that you look absolutely fabulous online and in print. Right. So. Speaking of the race, I want to thank everyone who has donated to my pick. Guys, you put me like way over my goal. In fact, I you, I met my goal like literally three days after I posted it on my birthday. Three days later, I met my goal. I upped my goal and I still went over that. So I want to say thank you to everyone who has donated. Uh, you can still donate. That doesn't mean you have to stop donating because all the proceeds are going to breast cancer research, to providing resources to women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, like I was in 2019. And so 2020 brought its own set of hell <laughs> when I was trying to recover from cancer. But that's okay, because here I am. And so I have these special little mugs, special limited edition Komen Race mugs that I have made just to give to you as a thank you for donating to my race and helping me and coming soon to a merch shop near you, are Renee's regular mugs. Yep, I have my own mugs, look. And the artwork was done by my daughter. So I'm just huge shout out to my girl who is, uh, during the pandemic, while she's waiting to go back on tour, has been upping her game with her art skills and doing a fabulous job. So guys, uh, just thank you. So all of those who have donated, um, you're going to get one of these. Those of you who still, if you want to donate, you want to get one, go ahead. I'm not stopping you. Go ahead and you can, I'll be sending the links where you can still uh, donate. And then tomorrow, watch my stories on Instagram and my stories here. I'll be posting because we are going to be racing and my sweet husband is joining with me. He's mapped out our route where we can end at one of our Fabulous little brunch places. So we're going to do the race and end up at the brunch place. Do the brunch, do an art walk, which is happening in our town, and then Uber back home. That's my plan for tomorrow. So I want to thank you all so much. There's my girl. Good morning, sweetheart. Let me see. i got to get her comments on here. There we go. Um, my daughter, Savannah, there she is. Bug, listen, you did a fabulous job on the artwork, so I can't thank you enough. Uh, those of you who are interested maybe in getting some graphic work done, I'll let you know if she's available. Anyway, thanks a bunch for that. Well, as I always like to do, I like to bring you some new book recommendations. And I just finished, so I finally finished Lenny Kravitz's book. It's really great. He doesn't he doesn't really spend a lot of time talking about his fame, or but he really talks about the process of him growing up. Gosh, the people he was around as a child because of his parents and their uh, positions uh, in their in, in that industry. Uh, the people that he met, his process, of course, meeting Lisa Bonet, having their daughter Zoe. Uh, it's an interesting look into his life and it, it, it helps you understand what influences him to create his stories in music form. So loved that book, but there were two more that dropped this week 
that I think you'll enjoy speaking, you know, of some great celebrities. So the first one uh, that was I'm really excited about, and I still got to learn how to share on my screen here like a pro. This is where I need my daughter to come in and like really help me. There we go. There it is. There's the button. <laughs> but those of us who have been in love with Matthew McConaughey, right? If you've ever had a crush on this man, if you've ever thought he was all that in a bag of chips, he has a new book out called Green Lights. So the man is 50 years old. And I think it's interesting that when people hit those milestone marks, they they tend to look back now. You have enough time to look back over your life. And so that's what Matthew McConaughey has done with his book called Green Lights. So he says, I've been in this for 50 years, been trying to work out this riddle for 42, and he's been keeping diaries. He says, keeping diaries of clues to that riddle for the last 35. So this man has been writing in his diary for 35 years. Guys, I'm telling you, if you have a diary, listen, look at your Facebook profile as a diary. If you can go back through your Facebook profile now that you have enough memories and it'll bring them up, right? Seven years ago, six years ago, five. mine go back 12 years, okay? So when you can look back at your own stories, sometimes there's a theme. There's something that runs through there. And so he says, notes about successes and failures, joys and sorrows, things that made me marvel and things that made me laugh out loud how to be fair, how to have less stress, how to have fun, how to hurt people less, how to get hurt less, how to be a good man, how to have meaning in life, how to be more me. So um, I'm interested to start this one. It'll be a really interesting look. You know, and it's, again, we tend to look at these celebrities as the people that we see them portraying on the screen, but there are people behind those iconic performances. Um, Matthew McConaughey is a, a professor at UT in Austin, sharing his gift with students. So anyway, check out his new book. It's called Green Lights, dropped on Tuesday. You can order it right now on Amazon and probably I'll well, have it to you by next week. So check that one out. The other book that I'm really excited about, because this man has been around all of my growing up life, and I really uh, appreciated his music. He lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but I remember watching this man burst on the scene and experiencing his fame as it was happening uh, because his music was part of my high school years. Um, you want one of the mugs, Teresa? Okay. You like, oh, you like Matthew McConaughey more as a man than an actor. Uh, yes, I can see that. I can see that. Some of the uh, roles he plays again. That's what's so interesting about their performances is that they they show us a different uh, Person in a character right a character in a story which is separate from who they are as a person. So um, Let's see here Teresa and you said Not enough coffee fart. Sorry for the messy message. Honey, listen, that's okay. In fact, let's all take a sip break. Shall we? Mm. So anyway, this other book that I want to share with you, um, great musician. You probably are familiar with his work. Um, and I love the title of his book because it asks a question. I got to learn how to do this faster. Do you feel like I do? Uh, well, this morning, Peter, I got to tell you, I'm not sure. I don't know if I'm feeling like you do. I know how I feel. <laughs> I'm kind of achy because I'm getting old and I'm on medicine that kind of makes me uh, have a little bit of joint ache. But Peter Frampton's new memoir, this is the first time he's ever written something like this. Do you feel like I do? Listen, I remember when that song came on the radio, that was a live performance that was recorded and that became such a classic hit. How many bands or groups do you know of where they their first song that comes out is a live recording and it sounds like that. So Peter Frampton's new book, look at him, isn't he pretty? Mm. I had a thing for British musicians back in the day. I still have a thing for British actors today. What is it about that? <laughs> anyway, Peter Frampton's new book. Um, it's really gonna be interesting to find out more about him. You'll find out that he went to school with David Bowie. 
that he had close ties to the Beatles and the Rolling Stone and performed with B.B. King and Stevie Wonder. And by the age of 22, this man was touring like crazy. He was one of the co-founders of a band back in the day called Humble Pie. So he has worked with so many great musicians. And you'll also hear about how he really never, you know, again, some of these people who are suddenly shot into fame, it, it's not necessarily what they want. They, they just want to be able to, to work on their craft and share their stories in maybe, in this case, in song form, okay? So, you know, he grew up with, again, like I said, David Bowie, he played with him on the Glass Spider Tour. Um, and then peppered throughout the story is a character in the story, not really a person, but a guitar known as the Phoenix, which he lost in a plane crash back in uh, 1980. Imagine losing something so important like a guitar to a musician or losing something valuable to you. Well, this guitar resurfaced in 2011 saved from the wreckage. How about that? So he's also had to come off the road and stop touring and stop playing because he is undergoing uh, a degenerative muscular disease called inclusion body myositis. I had to look that up. And what it does is over time weakens the body, weakens the body. And so he's had to stop performing live. He's had to stop touring. Now, for those of us who were able to see him live, to experience those moments when our favorite musicians no longer perform with their groups or they're no longer performing, we miss those opportunities to get to see them. So you'll get to hear all, all about this story and about his health challenges. And because he lives in Nashville, Tennessee, he is close to some of the best medical care in that region. And again, I was also privy to this, uh, this hospital in Nashville. So I'm sure that Peter's doctors, um, he's probably seeing doctors at Vanderbilt, which is one of the best uh, medical facilities in that part of the country. And just like Baylor and UT Southwestern here in Dallas, you know, these institutions are doing their part to help people like Peter, whether they're celebrities or everyday people, battle these challenges we have in our health. And so... His story is going to be a very eye-opening about him looking back over his life and looking at his career, the music that he's made, and all of those things that went into the person that he is today. So check out a copy of his book. So both Matthew McConaughey's book and Peter Frampton's book, they both dropped on uh, Tuesday. Was it Tuesday the 20th? Anyway, October 20th. It was Tuesday or Wednesday. Usually book drops happen on Tuesday. And so they're out this week, so you can grab a copy. So you want to check that out. So as I said, you know, Peter Frampton um, is facing a health challenge. We got news this week that Jeff Bridges, the actor Jeff Bridges, has been diagnosed with lymphoma, right? Not the dude, not the dude. And yet we're so thankful for doctors, doctors who are on my team, I'm sure he has great doctors on his team that are helping him come up with a plan to help battle what they're facing. And I'm sure Peter Frampton's doctors are doing that too. So I was privy to Vanderbilt because of course my late husband was treated for his cancer there. He had some of the best doctors who had, uh, had worked with him. We had some of the most incredible oncologists that we worked with, people who spend their lifetime working on battling these diseases. I know my oncologist, Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy, has been working eight years in the field of breast cancer research. And because of her expertise, I'm sitting before you here today rattling off about my coffee mugs and books and fundings and showing you my hair progress, guys. Guys, check it out. I have body, I have hairdo, right? But I'm so thankful for these people because they spend their lifetime studying and studying and studying their craft and being good at it, not only to be excellent at it, but also to share it with others and to help save lives. And that's why I'm walking in this race tomorrow. And that's why I'm so excited to have a friend of mine on today who works at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. She is a breast cancer research doctor 
while also going through her own journey of breast cancer. And in her spare time, she's also a very uh, successful published author. So I can't wait for you to meet and talk to my friend, Dana Cedars, Dr. Dana Cedars. Hi, Hi Dana. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad you were here. Thank you so much. It is such an honor and a blessing to have you on here. I mean, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate what you do, what Dr. O'Shaughnessy does um, in breast cancer research. So I, well, I wanted to ask you some- I'm glad sister because yeah. going through this, you learn quickly that it's scary, but you're not alone. And I would not be doing as well as I am without the love and support of the survivor community. So kudos to you. Well, thanks. I mean, we, we're in this together, right? Absolutely. We're going to be in this together. Absolutely. Yes. Well, Dana, you know, I enjoy you. I was talking with her just a little bit before the show started. You know, she is wicked funny. I'm telling you, she brings joy to my feed, girl. I just, uh, she was just showing me the little uh, baby frog that she was holding in her little, uh, in her yard there. So there's so many things about Dana that are so fascinating. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but Dana, how long have you been uh, studying breast cancer research and what made you want to study this particular field? I've been in it so officially for about 20 years. So I started um, my postdoctoral training at Vanderbilt in the year 2000. So, and that's when I really focused on breast cancer itself. Um, my graduate work at Vanderbilt was more about developmental biology and how the breast tissue developed. And one of the things we stumbled on was um, a gene product that could cause an overgrowth. So we started looking at kind of pre-cancerous events and then I became interested in um, breast cancer itself. So when I was diagnosed, and you know, it was really interesting because mine appeared behind some calcifications mm -hmm. that were in my breast. And I had been on hormone replacement therapy uh, because of menopause symptoms. Mm -hmm. And both my grandmother on my father's side and my father had breast cancer. Oh, wow. So my doctors were being very, very careful to monitor me, to check me, because they said, you know, I was having horrible menopause symptoms, which I needed to be on the therapy for anyway. But yeah. they said, you know, there is that small, tiny chance. Right. We're going to watch you closely. Yes. And so, of course, uh, when I, I checked the calcifications and found the lump myself, um, immediately went to the doctors. Mm -hmm. And they told me that the cells were behind, that I wouldn't have even known they were there had I not felt the calcifications. So what okay. I was really fascinated with when I was diagnosed is how many types of breast cancer there are. Oh my gosh, yes, there's so many. There, there are at least five different subtypes and there's subtypes within subtypes. The more we learn about the molecular genetics, the more we learn about different um, gene products that drive them. There are so many different types, but they do generally fall into patterns. So you can have hormone receptor positive disease like I had. Mm -hmm. um, you can have something that's driven by this oncogene called HER2, which basically is a cell surface receptor that tells cells grow, grow, grow. And that can become amplified for that particular type of cancer. Then there's another type, basal-like triple negative breast cancer. And that's because it doesn't have estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2. So basically no molecular targets that we've identified yet. And chemotherapy is the only treatment option. I mean, in a way, we're lucky because ER positive disease, we have a lot of drugs. Now, being on the receiving end of those drugs, the side effects are not fantastic, um, but they work. And the prognosis is for us is generally really good. And with the advent of Herceptin and Lapatinib, the HER2 targeted therapies, those revolutionize treatment for HER2 positive disease because those patients have very aggressive tumors that can um, grow really quickly and spread. So having those molecular targets are great. So now um, we need to work on finding stuff for triple negative breast cancer. And that's one of the things my lab is working on, trying to find new targets to help those patients. Well, that is fantastic because I've had a couple of friends who've had triple negative and yeah. it's been back to my friend April that I uh, interviewed last week uh, being diagnosed after she found out she was pregnant. Uh, that is so terrifying. I mean, I was, listen, Dana, I was amazed. First of all, you know, here I am in a breast cancer group 
and we're just talking about hair falling out. And here I am being all, oh, my hair, my beautiful hair is falling out. And she's like, you know, oh, well, your hair will grow back because I'm on Taxol. She was a little bit ahead in treatment. Uh -huh. Oh, but look, but look, my hair is growing back. Let me send you a picture. When I got the picture and saw this woman who's showing me how her hair is growing back while she's seven months pregnant, talk about being slapped down for being a baby. You know? I think, and so yeah. I, to know that mothers that are carrying children, that it's so specifically targeted um, yes. and doesn't hurt the baby. So my diagnosis, mm -hmm. when you talk about those three things, because again, I was amazed that once I was diagnosed, they had to do all these tests. To right. Really get it down to what's your particular type. Mine yeah. was estrogen receptor positive, of course, because mm -hmm. I, I was progesterone uh, negative mm -hmm. and HER2 negative. Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding this correctly, so it was definitely an estrogen, uh, uh, you know, a, a, in the, you know, started cancer. Um, and my HER2 score meant that it's not replicating fast, correct? Or that it does not replicate that fast. So my doctor was like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be, you're going to be, we've got this. We've got, this. she, she said, if it's this, we're going to do this. And if it's this, we're going to do all of this. I mean, she had, she had protocols laid out That's for, cool. she gave me like four different options. If it's this, we got this. If it's this, we're going to hit it with this. And I was like, wow. My, and then she ended the, the, the consult with, do, do you have any questions? And my husband was sitting there and he said, well, I did, but all I want to do is stand up and applaud you right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you have such wonderful healthcare team. Yeah, I mean, she was amazing. So, so um, let me ask you this because Dana, I, I've my husband even asked this question as we were talking about this after my diagnosis. You know, I, I, I'm also surprised at how many even young girls are diagnosed with breast cancer. Right? Yeah. I, I, I knew girls that even worked with me at the YMCA who was were like in their in the mid to maybe like 27. Um, yeah. and diagnosed with breast cancer, having to have like a mastectomy and all that stuff. Do you think that over the years, because of the development of birth control and the fact that we probably didn't really know that much about hormones back in the seventies, like we know about hormones now, do you think that the, the increase in cases of women getting breast cancer is due to other outside hormones? Our hormones, our, our food is full of hormones. We're on birth control pills. At yeah. some point, the body has to say no more, right? That's a really great question. And I know that so a lot of the people who are working in um, the environmental aspect of breast cancer, so looking at things that can from the environment that can trigger things, and like you mentioned, in food, things in the pharmaceuticals that we use. Um, I know they've tweaked birth control pills to have the lowest possible hormone doses to kind of mitigate that. Um, right. I don't know about the effects of long-term um, birth control on breast cancer incidence, but that's something I'll definitely look up. I mean, I was on birth control pills for years right. and before, before I um, had my tubes tied after my second child. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure those have some effects. The other thing too, is that, um, diagnoses and um, early detection has really gotten better. So some of the increases in cases that we're seeing may be just because we're better at finding them. That makes sense. That makes I was sense. Amazed. So the um, radiologist who looked at my um, tumor, so I geek out, of course, because I'm a nerd in this field. So no, I had I've a got a friend on who's watching my friend Cynthia. Yeah. So she's a pharmacist and she said, oh, she thinks it works on words I understand. Oh, fantastic. Nice to meet you, Sin. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she showed me um, side by side images on ultrasound of the benign lesion that they diagnosed a few years back and then the actual tumor. And um, they must have eagle eyes and, you know, 30 years of training because I could kind of see the little blebs. But if you ask me to like, are these the same or different? I'd be like, they look pretty similar to me. So, um, yeah, so the technology and just being uh, having the experience in the field. But, yeah, I've, I've wondered, too. So I, I lost a close cousin, unfortunately to breast cancer. She was 37 and she had gone through a lot of rounds of um, IVF treatment to have her son. And I had always wondered if that had an impact. I asked that question um, 
at almost every scientific breast conference I go to just because I'm curious. Um, they don't always release all the records, but um, what I got from an oncologist friend is um, it probably doesn't have a whole lot to do with it, but they never know. They right. we just don't know yet. So Cynthia said, yes, early detection leading to increased cases happens in a lot of diseases, not just cancer. Right, exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah. And again, that comes back to when we've been able to do 25 to 30 years of research in a disease. Yes. Now we're able to do, you know, now we're reaping the benefits of those early pioneers who were doing this back in the 80s and the 90s. Absolutely. And so now that we have this technology, now that we're able, again, like you said, we're able to detect this earlier and mm -hmm. treat it so that we don't, we, we can lessen the chances of women who are aggressively getting this to the point of where it goes into metastasis and uh, and they end up losing their life. So, yeah. And a lot um, of the, the predictive factors now, because like you said, we have so many years of research, um, we still have access to the tissues in most cases. So we can um, look at outcomes over time, over decades, and then go back to the original tissue and look at the genetic profile of the tumor and kind of get see some patterns. So that's one of the things with the Oncotype DX test um, for ER positive disease that can tell you um, right. your of recurrence and whether or not you'll benefit from chemotherapy that I remember um, uh, one of the developers of the test came to speak when I was a postdoctoral fellow and I was just blown away at like you can really do that you can tell those things and to um, 10 years plus years later to be able to benefit from that I I am humbled and honored you know to be in a field where so many people have done so much work that you know you never know what's going to come up that's going to benefit I mean this is like thousands and thousands of research studies by, you know, just so many dedicated professionals. And now we have these data and hopefully we can revolutionize some tests for other subtypes too. Well, yeah, I mean, again, I, I, I always want to hug my oncologist when I go see her. She's a little bitty woman. She's a little bit smaller than me. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were to put a gnome hat on her, she could be cast in the next Hobbit movie. She is oh. that cute and precious. Let me tell you, she is such a vivacious and powerful. I mean, when she comes in with her, what she calls, my scribes are following me, uh, mm -hmm. just, you know, and she will turn to them in such a calm voice. And I mean, she is imparting to them such yes. wisdom. I, I, I literally feel like I have left someone who's been in the presence of God and she's just bringing his best and coming. I just let you know, here's what we're going to do. And, and I'll mm -hmm. see you next, you know, and I'm just like, she touched me. She hugged me. She, you know, but anyway, I, so let's geek out for a little bit. I would science. love to geek out. I would love to geek out. Talk to me about some of the things, some of the new things that you've been working and studying in your lab. Um, some of the things that you're working on and some of the, the cool things that you're starting to see from what you're studying. Well, no, the biggest advance, um, which we're still trying to bring to more different types of cancer, is tumor immunity. So, anti-tumor immunity, trying to harvest or to harness our own immune systems to fight the tumor. It's a challenge because cancer is basically us gone rogue, right? There are right. cells they become altered. Um, in some cases, they're still very similar to our normal tissue. So the immune system doesn't always recognize it. Right. But in some cases, they um, change so much and they kind of muck up their genes so that the proteins they make are different enough that the immune system can recognize it, which is great because you can see in many types of tumors, um, B cells, T cells. So the, the cells that make antibodies, the cells that come in, the T cells that release things that kill Invaders, their normal role is to kill infected cells right, or right. bacteria. Um, so they can come in, but the tumor is very clever. It can often trick the immune system into working for it. It can change the nature of the cells that are infiltrating and get them to shield them from um, finding the immune huh. system. And also one of the things that they can do is basically um, they, they kind of use a Trojan horse thing where they upregulate this protein that will tell the T cells, okay, chill, go to sleep. We right. don't need you. So, and that's where the checkpoint inhibitors, you may have heard of um, some of those that are on the market right now, they block that interaction. So the T cells that are already in the tumor can do their job and fight the tumor. Got it. Got They've it. had it 
they've had when they're successful in the clinic, they tend to be really successful. Um, the problem is, so there's such, like you said, with breast cancer, there are so many different subtypes and with all cancers, they're somewhat different. So the right. challenge is getting the immune cells into the tumor in the first place. So we can use these checkpoint inhibitors to get them to do their job. Right. So, right. And so all the things that are going on in the immune system, I, that those ongoing studies, I think are going to revolutionize the field. Things that I'm doing, so I'm working a little bit on that, um, but I'm also working on this receptor. It's kind of like HER2. It's on the surface of cells, and um, it, when it is overexpressed or there's more of it on the cell than there should be, it causes the cell to grow, and it also causes the cell to move. So cells that break away from the tumor and move will kind of in, will invade your tissue. It'll enter the circulation, and that's what spreads to other parts of your body and can make me me yeah, metastatic. And that's why, so that's why my doctors order, like when they order scans, when yeah, they really yeah. want to look at your whole butt. Because I remember having like a full body PET scan because they wanted to make sure not that's a stray exactly cell. What they're doing. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Do that makes sense. Those. That makes sense. Yeah. So um, one of the things I'm looking at right now is this um, receptor may have a role in telling the tumor cells to go to the bone and to grow in the bone. And this is a big problem. So for prostate cancer, breast cancer, some other cancer types, um, that's one of the common metastatic sites. The bone marrow environment, right. so many nutrients, so much blood supply. I mean, the tumors right. can stop there and really just be happy. Um, so we're trying to figure out how this receptor helps them get to the bone. And also once they're in the bone, um, this receptor helps tell the bone cells that are involved in bone destruction. They're called osteoclasts um, to chew up the bone environment to make more room for the tumor. So we're trying to look at ways to see if we can block that by blocking this receptor and probably in combination with other drugs. That that's, is that's one of the most exciting things I'm working on right now. That, that is so, that is so cool. And, it, and you know what's even cooler is that I'm understanding everything you're saying. Oh, the way right. that you're explaining right. it. That's um, my goal. I really, so I have to tell you, um, you know, scientists are really good at talking to each other, but in general, we're not always good at talking to the public. So once I was diagnosed and this became my mission, I want to bring science, accessible science to people so they can understand, you know, what it is we do and why it's important. And right. I mean, that's, crucial, especially since, I mean, most of us are funded by taxpayer dollars, the National Cancer Institute. So I should be able to talk to anybody about what I do and why it's important and why they should invest in it. Right, right. Just power. So I think, you know, being able to understand what's out there, the good as well as the limitations, the ability to look past headlines, sensational headlines. That's one of my big things right now is, okay, right. digging. Well, I mean, you know, again, yeah. When this, you know, that's unfortunate about what's happening in our climate is because mm -hmm. scientists and experts in their field are being made to be called, you know, idiots or that you don't know what oh. you're talking about. Yes. When, when yes. you are the very people we turn to when these things happen, I'm not going to Google my own how to treat breast cancer. Are you kidding? That's right. going to take me on a weird rabbit hole. I wanted to find the best doctors in my area. I wanted to find ones that I could talk to that not only and I'm, I'm also the kind of patient where I don't want to just lay back and okay I can just inject anything in me do whatever you know I have questions Absolutely. I have questions it's your body and you are your own best advocate right and, and I mean and, and you are an expert in your field but again every person's unique body chemistry is is different and so you know as you advocate for yourself and talk with People like you, people like uh, my, you know, my doctors and teams, we're able to work collaboratively and I, I glean from, and I'm paying for your expertise to tell me, what can we do to fight this? What's the best way to get from here to here? So tell me about your own. So when were you, the, again, mind blown, here's a breast cancer researcher who's diagnosed with breast cancer. Because it's not like you're immune, immune. <laughs> right? It's not like you're automatically shielded from it. So when were you diagnosed, Dana, and how far along are you in your uh, progress? So I was diagnosed in 2018. It was April 19th. You always remember your diagnosis. Right. Yeah. yeah, July 2nd. Just an ordinary day. I was going in because, so I've always had issues ever since I started getting screened at the age of 40. You know, I'd, they'd find benign lesions. I'd already had a lumpectomy for a papilloma that was benign, but just causing a lot of pain. So I walked in thinking, yeah, I just had this biopsy. 
they might have to cut on me again. This is annoying. What am I going to make for dinner? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> then the, um, my lovely, lovely surgeon walks in and says, and I ask, how are you? She didn't ask how I was. That should have been my first clue. And she said, I have to tell you, you have cancer. And the world froze. Yeah. So, you know, I'm on the scientist part of me is thinking, oh my gosh, what subtype? What is it? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like bombarding her with so many questions. And the human side of me is going, what? Right. Cancer? What does that mean? Am I going to die? How am I going to tell my children? How am I going to tell my husband? How am I going to tell my colleagues? What is going to happen to me? Right. So it was, I mean, it's very humbling. I thought I knew cancer because I worked on it. I had you know, a cousin, I had friends, my mom had had it, but boy, you don't know it till it slaps you in the boot. You really right. don't. Exactly. Yeah. That is so yeah. true. That is so true. And I had been through, you know, my husband, my late husband had, um, mm -hmm. he had Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. Then he had it come back. Uh -huh. Then he had, um, he had liver cancer, which was brought on by hepatitis C, which we discovered he got from a blood transfusion back in like the 70s. Oh no. Because what, you know, at first it was hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. I was like, hepatitis C? Yeah. Same as not an intravenous drug user. I mean, I, what, right, how, right. How, it's not like you catch it, you know, what, what happened? Exactly. And I was like, wait a minute. So his recurrence that was in like 98, 99, wait a minute. So you didn't know they went through all his records. They went through all his stuff. They asked him, Mr. Harden, if you had any surgical procedures before, what was it? 19 something, 1984, whatever. Right. That involved blood transfusions. And he said, oh, yes. And they said, they started screening they, because they started screening and they said, it is our best guess. They didn't say for sure, but they said, mm -hmm. it is our best guess that this is how you had it. And it's been laying dormant in your body. And it took My this. Gosh. It to oh, man. So the third time he had cancer was liver and then he passed away in 2013. So mm -hmm. my experience with cancer was catastrophic. So when you yes. said, you know, when you were diagnosed and my first thought was, how am I going to tell my children? It was, how am I going to tell my children and have them not freak out and think I'm going to die too? Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? That's a and so a really tough conversation to have. Yeah. So, okay, so you've been diagnosed you in 2018. How are you in your, did you do treatment? What, and, you know. I did. So okay. um, I had surgery. Um, it was, I had a couple of tumors that probably had a similar origin. It wasn't clear to me whether they were the same tumor or two separate ones that came from the same origin, but they were able to remove it. So in um, 2018, I had um, oncoplastic reconstruction. So basically a large lumpectomy and a lift on both sides. So it was kind of, you know, that's not how I wanted to get a tit job, but <laughs> but <laughs> it ended up working in my favor. So that was great. Um, my Oncotype DX score came back with a score that suggested that I was low risk and probably wouldn't benefit from chemotherapy, which was a gift because, you know, I mean, of course I would have taken it because life, right. Right. but it's so nice. But, you know, it's amazing right. to me this treatment can, that this test can tell you whether or not it's going to help you because I can't imagine like, well, it's a crapshoot. Everybody gets chemo because we just don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I but, love, you know, I love the fact that even though like my friend April, even though we were, we were similar in our uh, chemotherapy programs, yeah. you know, because she was pregnant, they couldn't do the surgery before right. because you can't put a pregnant woman under. So, no. But when, so they did her chemo, they did everything. But as soon as she had her son and as soon as she recovered, I mean, they went in and got yes. the stuff and she had reconstruction yeah. and everything. So her outcome was completely different from mine, yeah. even though we were walking with similar types of cancer and similar treatments. Absolutely. Um, you know, and so again, that is just, it's, it's such an amazing thing. So, so again, I did have radiation and, um, the fun time, good times with trying several different um, estrogen blockers. Um, letrozole was not my friend. I made it through um, eight months. And then um, I woke up with what I called thriller hands. My um, joints and muscles were so achy. I just, yeah, I couldn't do it. That's what I'm doing. I'm on a nastrozole. 
Yeah, they took me on exemestane after that. I made it about a month, and then we just de-escalated to tamoxifen. And it's not great, but, I mean, I can still move. I mean, the hot flashes, whatever, I can handle those. I just want right. to be able to get in and out of my car and in and out of bed. Yeah, the only thing, I mean, I'm, but I'm also taking a lot of calcium. I take a lot yeah. of calcium, and I take a lot of D3. Um, and so I'm doing that naturally anyway. And of course I'm truly looking at my diet. I've always been that kind of person where I'm really trying to do, I exercise as much as I can every day. Um, I love hot, long, hot showers. <laughs> oh, they're wonderful. Yes. Hot showers, hot baths. Oh, so, and again, so I'm doing what I can. And then my oncologist is recommending that I get something called Zometa infusions like okay. twice a year. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, again, all of the things that, um, uh, Doctors like you who have come up with all these new things that we can try. Um, again, I, I just, I, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. I thank all the doctors and the people who are working so hard to help us target these things and come up with solutions and ways that people can have a more effective life and battle this disease. Well, we thank you because, you know, the support of the public, especially um, survivors, breast cancer survivors are a power. They are a force. They use their voices. They raise awareness. They raise dollars like you are. Um, they demand more funding go into this. So, you know, it's 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 a beautiful synergy. I absolutely love it. Oh, I apologize. No, no, that's okay. So here, so let's see. I'm going to go through the comments here because folks have been just chiming in and they're just really okay. enjoying our conversation. Yes. So Cynthia, my friend Cynthia, who is the pharmacist, she said tumors can be smart but they use it to be big jerks. She said, bone oh. marrow. Yeah, bone marrow is the source of so much cell and life creation where cancer get it can, gets in there. It can be a tough battle. Yes. Oh, absolutely. The um, tumors are so, they're so sneaky. They'll trick your um, the blood vessels nearby to send in new sprouts to feed them and then let them travel around. They'll trick your immune system into working for them. They'll go to fertile soil. That's kind of like a seed and soil um, thing is really important in the field because there are definitely patterns to metastasis. Breast cancer tends to go to bone marrow, to liver, to lung, to brain. Why doesn't it go to the spleen? Why doesn't it go to other parts of the body? And the theory is that um, these areas are kind of similar enough to their native environment that they can get by and adapt. Ah. And then trying to understand how they communicate with that new environment to set up shop because, you know, especially like for um, ER positive disease, we can have little micromets sitting around that are dormant for decades and then something wakes them up. That's the $64 billion question. What causes the dormant tumor cells to wake up and how can we stop that? How can right. we just manage this and make it so you live a normal lifespan and your micromets just never take off? Right. Right. But like you said, cause they could be, in your body. And, you know, I had the genetic testing done because since they yeah. said, you know, and I yeah. don't have the gene, I don't have it. I know. And so many, like, so probably a lot of younger women, I think are the ones that have the BRCA genes when they're diagnosed and that's why they're being screened early. But yeah, I mean, they did cause I'm adopted and I don't have a lot of my medical history. So I had the genetic testing too. And yeah, there's nothing in there. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I was grateful because again, yeah. my, I have sisters, my daughter, yeah. you know, yeah. Even my brothers, but since my father had it, would have had to get tested if yeah. I had come back positive. So yeah. again, thankful that tests like this exist because I don't think they did. How long has the, the, the genetic testing been around? Do you know? Um, for BRCA, it's been around a little bit longer, but like for the whole panels that they do, it's probably in the last 15 years or so. Don't quote wow. me on that. I'm not hundred percent certain, but yeah. And their advances um, coming, like I'm, I'm, I will be amazed to see 10, 20 years from now, what they have and what they right. what we, know, what we learn. Right. Well, and even my doctor, Joyce, she, when she put me on an astrodol, she said, now you're going to be on this and we'll, you know, see how you go. Because she said, honestly, in the next two to three years, we're probably going to come up with something new that we can put you on. That's not going to be, you know, so absolutely she, yeah she really takes it as a you know because again the the technology and the advances they're making now are yes. starting to come faster absolutely. and again all the data from the past years is starting uh -huh. to you know be available where they can make those kinds of studies yeah and now they can come up with products that are available for you know treatment and for stopping all of that so oh, i love absolutely. this 
my friend Kristen Ingram, she's a former cancer uh, survivor as well. Not breast cancer, but she had a different kind of, she said, I love how you explain things. You make it so understandable. Oh my gosh, that is my goal. That is what I, that's what I want to do. Like, so this new kind of avenue that I'm in now is advocacy and information. And yeah, I mean, hopefully I can be a good resource. Cause you know, I can, like, I try it out on my husband and my kids to make sure it's like, does this make sense? Or it's like, no mom, you sound like a professor. I'm bored. So <laughs> <laughs> they can tell me, like, they can help me out with, and I have a lot of um, survivor advocates in my network who can kind of help me. They've really helped with my communication, but that's definitely a goal that I have. I want to make it accessible and I want people to understand, you know, whether they're on the caregiver side, whether they're just um, curious, whether they, heaven forbid, um, face this disease. Right, right. Then, you know, if you go in armed with knowledge and I think your outcome is just going to be better. Plus, I mean, it's empowering. The unknown is so scary. I was terrified when I was diagnosed. And there are days that I'm still scared, but understanding what's happening and knowing that, okay, I'm on this medication, I'm doing everything I can, I'm, I'm you know, I've, I've cut out these things in my diet, I'm exercising, you know, all that stuff. It feels you're taking your health into your own hands. It gives you some of your control back because cancer right. can fill your power and, you know, you have to any way you can take it back. Yeah. Well, and I'm with you is that I think that when you, when we are empowered with information from doctors like you, that helps us make, we feel calmer because we have information. Okay. We can do this. Yes. There's all this, look at all the help and all the knowledge that they have. They're working hard to come up with this. They believe yes. this medicine is going to help me. Okay. I'm going to take this. I'm going to do this. And it helped me be able to not only calm myself, but then talk to my kids and say, Here's what oh, yes. going through. oh, yes, through. Oh, yeah. It'll be OK. It may look a little scary. It was a bit. So you're yeah. right. It is empowering. So I want to talk to you a little bit now about this other side thing that you do in all your spare time. <laughs> I, I don't watch a lot of TV. And also, my so the writing thing started because my husband's a pilot. And so he's gone half the week. And. You know, I just I, I thought I was going to write a little short story and have like a little uh -huh. small party and it ballooned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it nipped in the bud. So, yeah. talk, so you have so talk a little bit about your series because you have not just one, but several books that you've published. Yeah. So the part of me that doesn't um, isn't so analytical and works in the lab. The other part of me just loves these fantasy worlds like so urban fantasy, paranormal romance, you know, fantasy, that kind of stuff. Those are my go to genres because it's it's escapism. And right. you know, there's nothing better than having, you know, a happy ending in an amazing new world to forget your troubles for a while. I mean, that's why I love romance. A lot of people will be like mm, romance, girly stuff. I'm like, no, we are the genre of hope. We are the ones that you read when you're sitting in the hospital waiting to hear about your loved one. We're the ones when you're sitting like I was I was reading an amazing book about um, a cyborg who was getting implants put in, you know, while I was on the table getting ready for my lumpectomy. I was like, that's a great escape. <laughs> So I, that's what I do. So my urban fantasy series is it's it's based on um, ghosts and corporeal spirits. And it's basically um, a woman who gets caught up in the tricky business of afterlife management, which is a pyramid scheme. And she quickly finds out that um, she's going to have to shake things up a bit to make things better. That is so great. I love so that. The Soul Broker series. The other series. Um, so I've always been a mythology nerd. Like, seriously, I was like, do you remember Encyclopedia Britannica? And yes, all that? girl. I, yes, yeah. I was in there, too, looking up all the Greek and Roman gods. Yep. That is exactly what I did. So I was like, oh, man, I was like thinking mermaids are great. I, I love I'm fascinated by the lore, you know, especially since they can be seen as either monstrous, you know, luring sailors to their deaths. But also there's a lot of lore where they're healers and they're they, they bring music and art to the the world. So I kind of incorporated that and that turned out to be um, Southern Elemental Guardian series. So it's mermaids. It's um, basically they're, they're guardians of the natural world. So you have water for the mermaids, um, air, sylphs. Um, it, my sylph character is one of my favorites. His name is Bruce and he steals every scene he's in and he insists on being in every single book. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And then we have um, dryads for um for wood and earth and then fire. I have a Phoenix character. There you go. I love that. So see, yeah. I love that in the midst of, again, your analytical side of doing all this, your imaginative side 
is just flourishing and creating. That is so fantastic. But also you talked a little bit to me about that you are you also have a proposal out for a nonfiction book. And and right. so tell me a little tell us a little bit about what this nonfiction book is going to be about um, and how you're doing on, you know, your story process so far. Well, um, so I figured since um, I've been on two sides of breast cancer, I've been on the research side and I've been on the survivor side that um, my perspective might provide some insight that could help other people going through this. So it's definitely a passion project. So I came up with a proposal. Um, thanks to Alice Sullivan, your buddy, who um, taught me, she basically, a few several years before that, sent me um, a primer on how to do nonfiction proposals. And I hired her. I said, I need your help. I need to know how to lay this out so I could get an agent. Yep. So she was great and helped me um, lay out. I've got sample chapters that basically, I'm trying to mix in accessible science humor and kind of the human story but i mean mostly focused on if you're diagnosed with breast cancer if somebody you love is diagnosed with breast cancer if you're a caregiver these are the things that might help you these are the things that you could know so we go from the basics what is normal breast tissue i mean what does it do it's the cell these are the cells that become breast cancer are usually the ones that line the ducts that help the milk go to the nursing infant so we talk about normal breast development, anatomy, physiology, and then go into, okay, this is what gets messed up in cancer, and this is how the process works. And then everything yeah. from spread to um, different subtypes, different stages, grades, um, the practical stuff, like, for example, with radiation therapy, knowing that um, soft cotton tees are your friend. Do not wear a bra. Use the the my girls my girls cream oh, yes, listen. Yes. all those tips that i got i am so grateful to the survivor community like there's so many facebook groups you can go in um so what bra do i need for a mastectomy that i'm having in may and i'll tell you it's great yep, yep. i'm in a cup i'm in one here um, in dallas for the local area it's been fantastic the women in there are wonderfully supportive they're so i mean when i needed to know Okay, where can I get some good wigs? Yes. Where can I get some head coverings? It's like, yeah. man, they were like, oh, go ahead, see my friend. I mean, they were just absolutely, it yeah, was so fantastic. So, well, I think a book like that is going to be so helpful because it's not just going to be for women my age, but even young women. Yeah, I would love that. Young women who may be skeptical and, you know, they're getting all their information in groups, but they're not really sure even if the information, because, you know, as you know, in some groups, Everybody's yes. got an opinion and then you've got so much information, but to have scientifically backed information that is in a very practical setting that helps you understand what you're going through is going to be huge. So I'm excited. I can't wait to read your book. I hope I can help. I also have, a, I'm going to have a whole section on teasing past the headlines, fake news, woo woo scams. Cause I mean like, so complimentary alternative medicine is great in that it's complimentary, but and so that's fine. Like anything, if it doesn't do harm, if it makes you feel good, that's great. Right. But you know, right. the people who are um, touting this um, oil is going to cure your cancer and you won't need chemo or this is going to help here, you know, like without any scientific backing. Those people really bug me because yeah. they their disinformation can cost lives. I, you know, so right. I'm all about trying to combat that. Yes, these treatments are not fun. They work. And if you want to use your time, you know, support research that are trying, we're trying to find things with fewer side effects. We're trying to find treatments that target the tumor and don't destroy the rest of your tissue, you know, right. focus on that. It's not, there's no cancer pharma Illuminati. I've been accused of that so many oh times. Lord. I'm like, oh. where's the pharma money? Nobody's paying me, you know, right. my check, right? right? I don't give you. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we're not hiding the cure. We're terrible oh. at keeping secrets. And I mean, we're human. So if anybody had the cure for the cancer, which is so many different diseases, we, somebody wouldn't, would be putting it out there. Right. It would leak. Yeah. It would leak. Yeah. It would get out there somehow. Yeah. Absolutely. I and mean, because we're in a capitalist society, somebody would profit from it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. If they can make a buck, they'll do it. Exactly. So yeah, no, nobody's going to keep this a secret. <laughs> right. Well, so, so good. So you are healthy. You're doing great. Um, yeah. So I, I did have a um, residual disease that they found earlier this year. So, but the, the good news is they caught it early again. Um, I wanted to hug my radiate 
my mammogram technologist because she put me through so many paces just to find this thing that turned out to be a problem. And six millimeters, it's gone. I had a mastectomy. And then in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get Franken put back together. They're going to take thigh tissue and build me a new left breast. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, look at, all the, look at the folks. Uh, my friend Teresa, <laughs> she says, um, I believe that your creative side helps your analytical side in your research. Do you find that to be true? I think so. I think so. Just like being able to think out of the box and like any, anytime you can exercise um, more than one part of your brain and help with balance, I think it, it feeds into each other. Yeah. yeah. I like to keep my brain busy because that just helps me, you know, if you're working on, if I'm working on, you know, something where, where I'm writing, sometimes a scientific, you know, a lab idea will come into my head. And it's just like that spontaneity. I don't know how it works. I probably should look into I have a friend who does neuroscience. So I'm going to ask her about that. How does teasing this one side of your brain, make, tickling this other side, make it help, you know, make it work for the other side. But I'm sure there's something to that because, yeah, I mean, if, if you're in it too much, and I've seen this with a lot of colleagues who are burning out, if you're just like struggling and banging your head against the wall and you're just focused on science, 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 this one little problem, it, it can stymie you. So sometimes it's good to step away and do something different. And, you know, in your subconscious, your brain's trying to work on this problem and figure out how to address it. And then, you know, also if your body's calm, you're not as stressed, that's going to help you think better too. Well, you know, I mean, and that, that is so true in, in all fields. I mean, yeah. I've, my daughter's been really working on upping her game with her art and she mm -hmm. was, you know, working, 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 working on this one piece. She is trying to get yeah. it. And I, and I texted her and I said, why don't you go like, take, take Gabe for a walk around the block or go make a snack yeah. or something or step, yeah. step away from it for a few minutes. Because oh my gosh, telling your kids eat something. Did you remember to yeah. eat? Sweet? Did you <laughs> eat, go take a nap. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But just, it's true. Even with writing, you can't just, you know, sit and just pound, 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 pound. pound. Your right, brain right. is like, is, you know, is like a vessel you've got to yeah. pour in. You've got to nourish it and create it so that it can produce an outflow can come out, whatever it is that you are gifted at, but you have Absolutely. to give your body a chance to regenerate. So that requires sleep, that requires yes. eating, that requires yes. stepping. And you also, when you step away, you're then able to walk back and look at it with a fresh set of eyes. Absolutely. And see something you didn't see before, or be able to identify something. Yes. yes. So again, my daughter said, uh, she said, this all makes sense, really good to know. And Kristen said, those of us who have had cancer or who have family members with cancer appreciate doctors like you. So oh my gosh, thank you so much. I mean, we, this is why we do what we do. We do what we do because, you know, cancer touches everyone. It's it's one of the great plagues of humanity. You know, before I got it myself, you know, I, I was with my mom with a toddler on my leg and a baby on my hip helping her change her surgery drains. So, you know, and it's just like, those are the people I, I work for my mom. I work for you. I work for my friend Pam, who was diagnosed with stage three and is doing great now. But I, you know, we oh, saw her gosh. go through all the stuff that she went through. Those we we work for we work for you guys because we want to make the world a better place and we want to make humanity's condition better. Well, again, Dana, I mean, I can't tell you how much not only do I appreciate what you're doing. I also appreciate that you are an author as well, that that is just another expression of your talent um, besides what you do in the medical field. So thanks also for contributing a f to the fun genre. And that's, just, making I, that's, my, that's my one thing that I do that's like solely for me. So I, you know, that's why I love it. Well, that's great. I mean, that's yeah. great. And I think, you know, as more people understand, and what I also love is that even despite your diagnosis, your own personal diagnosis, um, you're still creating and you're still writing, which is so important because we have stories in us every day that we need to share. Yes, yes. Uh, whether it's in whether it's in a field like science, whether it's in the business world, yeah. whether it's in the imaginative and the creative yeah. world too. So, well, girl, listen again. Like I always tell you, you know, I'm always I feel, but sometimes I'm like, you know, oh, that's funny. Oh, God, that is funny. I mean, just I'm going through your stuff and like, like because and and time and again. Your stuff will pop in at a time when I'm just like, "Ooh, girl, okay." I'm so glad. 
I so, needed that. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm a ridiculous person, but if I can make you laugh, <laughs> that's just going to make me happy. <laughs> well, and you know what I love too is that it takes the stigma off the doctor research types that people think that all scientists are like so geeky, nerdy, hold up in a building and, you know, or doing yeah, yeah. for the government, whatever. No, no, no. You were cool people. You were really cool people. Very good, man. You know, we like we like to we like to go out. You know, conferences. You know, I miss conferences because happy hour when you know you have a few drinks and you know everything. Like, <laughs> like watching geeks party is great, and I'm one. I'm sure that everybody feels the same way. Like watching a, me let loose as a geek is <laughs> funny too. So yeah, it's so great. Well, uh, let's see here, Cynthia. Oh, Cynthia says she said, "Yeah, we are terrible at keeping secrets. We uh, we need that shirt." Which yes. one are you? Yes, Whoa. yes. That's funny. That is great. Oh. And yes. Savannah said, "Yes, I can get in an obsessive hole sometimes, but time blocking outbreaks really makes a difference." Oh That's my so god, true. Yes. That is so true. Yes. Well, Dana, listen, I I could talk to you for hours, girl. I mean, we could just sit I on here and so last. So but fun. thank you. Listen, thank you so much because most of my friends who've been on here, uh, Teresa, she said, let's see, her diagnosis on my daughter's birthday, different year oh, of wow. course. Yeah. So, you know, and my friend Teresa, she also had a lumpectomy. So, I mean, like you said, it touches everybody somehow. We <laughs> either know someone, and I know that even when I was diagnosed, I found out the stats are that one in eight, yes. one in eight will be diagnosed. Yeah. And so, I appreciate that there are doctors like you who are fighting so diligently to make that number be one in 50 or yeah. one in 60 rather than one in eight. So again, thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you to all your colleagues, everybody at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center here at the Baylor Salmon's Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we appreciate the work that you do. Um, and guys, if you Google her, all you got to do is Google her name. Uh, girl, I saw, here it is. There it is. There's her name, Dr. Dana Cedars. The stuff she's created, you know, I even just, Dana, as as fun, I just tried to open it and read it. And I was like, okay, these words are so big. I have no idea what this means. But somebody <laughs> does. Somebody does. And the way you were, it was just like, wow, this is just fascinating. So oh. again, I, we can't thank you enough for the work that you do. Um, I'm glad that you are doing better physically in your own journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm so glad yeah. every time I see your smiling face I'm like yes my survivor sister's thriving listen grateful for every single day and I am so excited to get out there and walk tomorrow yes. So yes. I'll be doing that so thank you so much for your time I really appreciate yes. it and guys again you can uh, check her out and we'll, I'll put a link to her book series in the oh, comment yes. thread here Dana I'll also be sharing your book series listen anytime I can highlight a great creative author. I love it. So, um, and we'll have to do this again. I would love to. I would love okay. to. Hi, um, buddy. He has to come say hi. <laughs> Listen, I'm surprised my cat didn't jump up in the chair. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Bye. <laughs> Apparently it's time he needs some mommy time. So yeah. <laughs> right. All right, Dana. Well, thanks so much again, girl. It's been a pleasure. Um, I enjoyed every really appreciate you and guys, you can check her out. I'll be sending all her links in the comment thread below so you can check her yeah. out. And again, tune in tomorrow. We're going to walk and raise some more funds to help breast cancer research and may have more survivors. All right, Dana, thanks a bunch. Take Thank care. You. Guys, we'll see you next week.